17th August, The Mask We Wear by Pastor Simon James. Greetings in the name of Jesus and welcome to Riverside Tabernacle. I am Pastor Simon and it's my honor to share God's word with you tonight. We trust you'll find this message inspiring and uplifting. And may you be receptive to the voice of the blessed Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for this thy word. We believe, O oh Lord, that this word is from your heart and from your throne. And we know, O oh Holy Spirit, that you are going to speak to us tonight and help us to understand your word. Help us to be convicted by your word and help us to make corrections in our lives so that we live by your word. We ask these mercies in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Amen. Praise God. The masks beware. Our reading is taken today from the second book of Timothy, or the second letter of Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 through to 5. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. This is what Paul gives as advice to the young pastor Timothy. Must Christians. Jesus' followers were first called Christians in the city of Antioch and that can be found in the book of Acts chapter 11. <clears throat> the term Christian is used for any person who by faith has received Jesus Christ as the only Savior from sin, and in whose heart the Spirit of Christ resides. Romans 8, 9 says it very clearly. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. If Christ does not indwell you, then you do not belong to him. Where there is something worthwhile, there will always exist counterfeits. If there is something that is worth buying, there's always a counterfeit which tries to imitate it. You think of a phone, you get a good phone and then you get a fake or a counterfeit phone, which looks like the real thing, but it's not the real thing. This is also true of Christians. Although there are almost 2 billion people who identify as Christians, a large portion of them are counterfeit Christians. The fake always claims to be the genuine article or at least as good, but in reality, it is not. Mahatma Gandhi said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. His words were true then and they are still true today. And this was one of the reasons that Mahatma Gandhi did not receive Jesus as his savior. Erroneously, he believed that if the people cannot be like Christ, then Christ was not worth him having. Sadly, that points to many counterfeit fake Christians who look like the genuine article, but are not. Now, one who goes to church is no more a Christian than a person who lives in a garage is a car. Association with Christianity does not a Christian make. A Christian is someone who has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This person is saved according to Romans 10:9, which says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The paramount difference between believers and non-believers is the Holy Spirit or the residence of the Holy Spirit who lives or abides within believers as it, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 1.13. And when you believed in Christ, 
He identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. Therefore, a counterfeit Christian by these arguments is one who has not genuinely been born again, but puts on a mask to fool others into believing that they are genuine Christians. Now a mask may hide your identity from others and may even hide your flaws from you, but it cannot hide your true identity from the omniscient God, the God who knows everything. What is a Christian? And what does it mean to be a Christian? There's two different, this, these are two different things. What is a Christian and what it means to be a Christian? Or what does it take to be a Christian? Now we are told and we are taught to come to Jesus as we are. And he will transform us. We, are, we, are, we come to Jesus as we are. But we are not supposed to stay that way. We are supposed to grow more like Jesus Christ each day. There must be a progress in the heart and life of the Christian. Day by day, we continue fighting the urges to sin and committing to Christ must be accompanied by true repentance. The people who were called Christians at Antioch when Paul and Barnabas preached there, they were called Christians because they were like Christ. Now, many people think that going to church occasionally or simply believing in, in God or believing in Jesus makes them a Christian. But the Bible presents a different perspective and definition of a Christian. A Christian is someone whose behavior and heart reflects the Lord Jesus Christ. A Christian is someone who is a little Christ or he's like Christ. The word Christian means of or relating to Christianity. This is from the Merriam-Webster dictionary. It is means based on Christian scriptures or conforming with Christian ethics and beliefs. Now one becomes a new creature in Christ when one receives the Lord. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Now Christianity is not a matter of talk. It is not a matter of just professing that you are a Christian, but it is a matter of a change of mindset and lifestyle and walking in obedience to the Lord and to the Holy Spirit who guides us in our minds. The old man who serves the flesh is gone, has been replaced by the new man who serves the Lord. The Holy Spirit transforms a sinner into a child of God. So if you do not see a transformation in you, then chances are you haven't met Jesus or you haven't committed to Jesus. However, very important, the Holy Spirit will not force himself upon the individual. The Holy Spirit is God. He is the third person of the Holy Trinity. The Holy Spirit is not an it. It is not an object. It is not a force. He is God and he will not force himself on to the individual. He will not force himself on you. God gives you freedom of choice. If you do not invite Jesus into your heart, he will not enter your heart. Now a truly born again Christian will follow the commandment of Jesus. What do we mean by a born again Christian? A person who is truly saved. A truly born again Christian will follow the commandments of Jesus. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, these are the words of Jesus. If you love me, keep my commandments. Conversely, if you don't keep his commandments, it means that you do not love him. That is the mark of a true child of God. The counterfeit Christian, on the other hand, will not obey the Lord because he does not love the Lord. He will not love the Lord because he has a problem with the commandments of the Lord or the lifestyle that God expects him to live. And God expects us to live in this earth, on this earth, but as if we do not belong to this earth. Tonight we will look at a few things that men and women do that a true Christian will avoid at all costs. Sometimes they do slip up, but in the main they will avoid it. These things... Among others, the list is not exhaustive by any means, but these things amongst others 
identify one as a counterfeit or fake Christian. I am not going to judge you. That is not my place to judge you. I am not here to tell you that you're a counterfeit Christian or you're a genuine Christian. You must do that yourselves. You must judge against the word of God. All I will do is point out these fake Christian traits. And if, they, and if that's something that you have in you, then you have to deal with it yourself. You're not a true Christian if you dot dot dot. And I'm going to go through 10 quick, 10 things quite quickly. You are not a true Christian if you won. If you have not genuinely accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, as the person who saved you from sin. And two, if you are not living by the Holy Spirit or and, and another uh, uh, alternative to that or a variation on that is, you might have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you might have done it genuinely. But if you're not living by the Holy Spirit's guidance, then you're not a true Christian. Then you need to look at yourself tonight. You see, when we give our heart to the Lord, when we accept Jesus, we believe in our heart, we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God say, resurrected him from the dead and we are resurrected with him. If we have not genuinely given our hearts to the Lord, if we have not genuinely repented from our sins, then we're not Christians. Because you cannot be a Christian, you cannot be a child of God and willfully sin. You cannot be a child of God and indulge in the pleasures or the, of, of, of the flesh or in carnality. We cannot do the things that we used to do that displeases God. And the Bible is very clear. It is, it is pregnant with the things that we should not do and the things that please God. The Bible tells us in many places in the Bible, throughout the word of God, it tells us where or it tells us about the things that displease God and tells us about the things that please God. So number one is, if you have not genuinely accepted Jesus Christ and you are not living by the Holy Spirit, then you are not a true Christian and you need to take a look at your life again. And even if, even if it means going back to the drawing board, as it were, going back to the Lord and saying, Lord, forgive me for not accepting you properly, for not living by your word. For not listening to the Holy Spirit. You see the Holy Spirit speaks to us in our mind. He tells us. He guides us. He warns us. He encourages us. He comforts us. He does all these things. But if we do not listen to him. Then we are displeasing him. And the Bible says we hurt the Holy Spirit very easily. It is very easy to grieve the Holy Spirit. Whilst God is such a powerful God, his spirit is very easily grieved. And one of the things or the main thing that grieves the Lord and it grieved him so much in the Garden of Eden that he kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden is rebellion, is disobedience, is willful disobedience. If you didn't know when you did it, yes, God will forgive you for that. But if you know when you do it, then you have to go back to God and ask him to forgive you. And you have to be truly repentant. And repentance means to walk away from it. Walk away from it. Not to, to repeat it. Repentance and repeat are two different words. The second one. Very important for husbands, wives and children. Very important. And I'm, I'm, I've chosen these. Not because they are they, they are all, the all uh, I mean uh, they are the, the total list of things that a Christian shouldn't do, but these are things that I found that are common problems with Christians, common problems in churches, and pastors tonight will agree with me when they listen to this because many times these are the things that pastors have to counsel people about. Number two, and it's got three parts to it. When a man does not love his wife, he cannot be a true Christian. The book of Peter says that it hinders your prayers. 
You can pray all you want, man, but if you do not love your wife, your prayers go unanswered. Now, why did God ask a man to love his wife? Why didn't he say to the man, honor your wife? Why did he say love your wife? Because if a man loves his wife as he loves himself, he will honor her, he will protect her, he will look after her, he will make sure she's well fed, she's well clothed, he will take all the care of her as he takes of his own body. Remember, God said that the two shall become one flesh. So a man ought to love his wife. And why does the Lord say, man, love your wife? Another reason is, love is not, and some people are going to take exception to this, but I don't care. I'm going to tell you how I feel. Love is not a natural trait in a male. Men will give love to get sex. Men, many times when they talk about love, they're talking about lust. So that is why God said, you need to love your wives as Christ loved the church. In other words, selfless love, that even if you need to give your own life for your wife's life, you need to do it. Second thing, women, you don't get off the hook tonight. The Bible says, honor your husband. Now this is being said by the Lord, and I believe this. It's because it's about the hardest thing that a woman can do is honor her husband. It's about the hardest thing that a wife wants to do is to honor her husband. Most wives, and I've seen hundreds of them in my ministry, they dishonor their husbands. They want to talk over him. Not that he, they might be cleverer than him. They might be more intelligent. They might have a degree or two degrees or more degrees than him or whatever. The husband might be a, a factory worker and the, and the wife might be a doctor. But even then the Lord says, honor your husband. Honor your husband as the head of the home, as the church honors Christ. And I want to tell you something. Women find this very difficult to do. Women, women find it easy to honor the pastor who is not their husband. They find it very easy to honor even their fathers. Sometimes even to honor their, and, sorry, even to honor their bosses. Or sometimes even to honor other men who are women's husbands who are in positions of leadership. But they find it very difficult to honor their husbands because they think that their husbands are too slow for them, their husbands are too weak for them, their husbands are just boring, whatever. Lady, woman, wife, honor your husband or you're not a true Christian. Men love your wives or you're not a true Christian. And a person who's not a true Christian ain't going to heaven. They're not going to heaven. Children, I haven't forgotten you. The Bible says, the fifth commandment says, honor your, pair, your, your father and your mother so that it would be. Go well with you and you live long on the earth. Do not dishonor your parents. If you dishonor your parents, if you are flippant about your parents, if you don't want to make a, a amends with your parents, now it doesn't matter what they did to you, but you can reach out to your parents. So if you're listening to this and you haven't reached out to your mother in a long time, you haven't reached out to your father, then reach out to them. Or you haven't reached out to your guardian who is acting as your father or mother, then you are in serious trouble with the Lord because you are dishonoring your parents. And if you dishonor your parents, the Lord says that if you honor them, you get long life. The converse is also true. If you dishonor them, you won't live so long. Children, honor your parents. I know your parents are silly. I know as they get older, they get more like children. And you get irritated with them. They make the wrong decisions. They get conned. They buy the wrong stuff. They forget where they left their spectacles when it's on their head. They do other things. They make you, they get you upset. They annoy you with their little uh, idiosyncrasies. You get upset with their little habits. You get habit where you get upset when they clear their throat or the, the, with the slow speed that they walk, that you have to hurry them up. You get tired of the way or you don't like the way they smell or whatever. Let me tell you something. You give in to those fleshly feelings and you upset those parents or you dishonor them. God will not 
honor you when you go to heaven. You'll, you won't get to heaven. Sorry, that judgment. You'll go the other way. Thirdly, and I'm going to rush. I don't have much time. If you are not prepared to forgive and pray for your enemies, then you're not a true Christian. Now, let me, let me qualify what I'm saying. Every one of us prays. I know we pray. I know you pray. Maybe it's only when you're in difficulty, but you pray. But if we are not prepared to forgive our enemies, it's easy to forgive your wife. It's easy to forgive your children, your husband, your friends. But it's very difficult. It's infinitely sometimes, infinitely difficult to forgive your enemy. Especially if that person has hurt you in a way. Now let me tell you, many times your enemy is just a friend that you've lost or a friend that you don't know. But the qualification here is praying for your enemies and not praying that God will punish them or God will rain fire and brimstone on them. We always like to say, God, you deal with this person. Lord, this person hurt me. I want you to hurt them. I want you to let them feel the pain. No, you pray for your enemies that God will forgive them. That God will save them. Because if your enemy is saved, he becomes your brother. And you, let me tell you, when you get to heaven, if you get to heaven, when you look down from heaven and you look across the, uh, the, 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 the vast uh, uh, valley between, uh, chasm between you, heaven and hell, I'm taking it from, the, from Jesus' description of uh, the rich man and Lazarus, and you see your enemy burning in fire, you will feel sorry for him. I'm telling you something, you will feel sorry for Adolf Hitler as well. So if you have enemies here who are nothing like him, they've just hurt you a little bit because they spoke about you and you're so upset, pray for them. That is true love. It's easy to love your friends. It's infinitely more difficult to love your enemies. Yet Jesus loved his enemies with the nails in his hands and the nail in his feet. With the crown of thorns on his head, suffering, asphyxiation, in pain, bleeding. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What do you think Jesus was doing? He was loving on his enemies. He was loving them. He was praying for them. If you can do that, you are a Christian. If not, you need to get with it. Get with the program. Number four, if you are not charitable when it is in your power to do so, then you're not a Christian. Yes, faith, they say, faith is not of works. Our faith is not of works, but our works are by our faith. Because we believe in the Lord, because we have faith in Jesus, it shows in our works. And part of our works is to take care of the poor and needy. Remember, everything you have, everything you have is not yours. It's from God. God gave you the power to earn that. God allowed you to get that. So when you got it, make sure that you are a good steward of God's money. Some of you are rich. And when you're rich, you trust more in your money. And you love your money. And you think that you shouldn't give it away. Let me tell you, God says, those that give to the poor lend unto the Lord and the Lord is no one's debtor. So if you see a beggar and you can help him, help him. Number five, and I spoke at length on Sunday about this. If you participate in idol worship or dabble in the occult, I've spoken about idol worship. If you participate in idol worship, you're not a true Christian. Forget it. You can be a pastor like I know some of them are. You're not a pastor. You're not a Christian. Go and ask God for forgiveness and turn from your wicked ways because idol worship is an abomination unto the Lord. And so is dabbling in the occult. You dabble in the occult. A friend of, uh, not a friend, but somebody I knew recently and I had a few chats with them have been dabbling in the occult and now they believe in some weird beliefs called Christ consciousness which is nothing but yoga and Hinduism in disguise. It's the occult. 
Do you know that reading your fortunes in the in in, in the book uh, in the newspaper, reading your stars, lots of us like to read our stars. Do you know that's dabbling in the occult? That is consulting someone else other than God. Stop that, because God is going to hold you accountable for it. Number seven, very important, and I've got five minutes to finish, and I'm aimed to do that. Number seven, sorry, number six. When you love money more than the Lord, when you'd rather be in your business on a Sunday than be in church on a Sunday morning, when you'd rather be on a Tuesday night in your, in your business than come to church, when your business keeps you away from the Lord and you love your money so much, then you're not going to heaven because you cannot love God and money. You cannot serve God and mammon. The Bible says the demon that sits behind the love of money is mammon. And if you love money more than you love God, then you are not a true Christian. Nothing. Then that is idol worship. You can tell me, but I work hard for my money. I'm quite happy for you to tell me that. And I'm quite happy to tell you. I don't care what you say about it. If you, do, if you love that money more than God, more than Jesus, then you have placed an idol in front of Jesus. And that is an abomination unto the Lord. Number seven. If you use the name of the Lord in vain. Oh my God, you say. And you hear on TV, they use the word, the name Jesus Christ as a swear word. For some sake. They say Jesus and they swear. They use the, they say Jesus Christ, but in a word, in like anger, in temper, in, 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 in uh, arrogance, defiance, in uh, frustration. That's using the name of the Lord in vain. It is just as good as using the Bible to justify what you want people to know. Using the name of the Lord, the Bible says the Lord will not hold him guiltless. That means you'll be held guilty if you use the name of the Lord in vain. Thou shalt not use the name of thy Lord, thy God in vain. So be very careful. Stop that. Stop that saying, oh my, and using the name of Jesus Christ. Stop teasing the Holy Spirit. Stop making religious jokes at the Christian God. He's your God. Will you joke like that about a judge of the earth? And this is the judge of all the earth. And you want to joke about him? Number eight. If you do not study the word of God, then you're not a Christian. These are the words of Jesus. How many of you read your Bible today? Ah, oh, don't answer that. Oh, anyway, you can answer. I can't hear. Uh, you can see me. I can't see you. But if you haven't studied your Bible daily, if you do not study the Bible, I'm not saying just open a few verses when you go to bed and you're in sleep. That's not it. You need to study the Word of God. You need to know what's in the Word of God. This is Jesus' love letter to you. How come? If you say you love the Lord, you should know what He's saying. You should know what he's saying. You should try and memorize some of his word. Study. Number nine. If you do not witness for the Lord, in other words, tell others about Jesus, then you're not a true Christian. You're a selfish brute. You're a selfish person. Because if you see your brother walking toward an end of the cliff and it's dark he doesn't know that's a cliff when he gets to the end of it he's going to fall down and he will die will if you see him walking in the direction will you not warn him of course you'll warn him because he's your brother of course you'll warn him you'll say be careful don't go that way because there's a cliff you're going to fall there's sharp rocks and there's a sea there and you'll either drown or be uh, crushed against the rocks but yet we do that every day we see thousands of people going to a Christless eternity they're all walking towards hell they're all going to to hell but we don't want them we know where they're going but we don't care to warn them we're going to heaven that's all it matters as long as I'm going I'm all right you're all right it's fine but I don't care about anybody else I'm fine my wife's fine my kids are fine we're going to heaven Oh, happy day. But what about the others? 
Number 10, the last one. If you follow false prophets, and there are many false prophets. And how do you know a false prophet? You'll know him by his fruit. You'll know him if he's by his non-conformance to the word of God. A false prophet preaches his own brand of the gospel. He, they, they try not to preach the, the true. They won't preach the true word of God. They'll twist the scriptures. And if you follow a false prophet, then you're a fake Christian. Because a true Christian will not follow a false prophet. Now, after listening to this message, you may have been shocked to realize that you are a counterfeit or fake Christian. Possibly. I'm not saying all of you, but some of you might have come to the realization tonight that, wow, I am a counterfeit Christian. I'm a fake Christian. Now, I know it is, it is a difficult conclusion to come to if, if it applies to you, but I have good news for you. I have good news for you. And I'm going to talk about Simon Peter. Simon Peter did something unimaginable when he denied the Lord. It was like when he denied the Lord Jesus Christ, it was like the ultimate betrayal for him. He felt he was in the same shoes or in the same situation as Judas who betrayed the Lord. He thought his relationship with the Lord was over, irrecon irreconcilable and unrecoverable. He was depressed and he gave up on his ministry. You remember what he said to the disciples? They said, what are we going to do? He said, I'm going fishing. I don't know about you, but I'm going fishing because that's all I know. I'm going to fall back. Jesus ain't here anymore. He's gone. So I'm going fishing. I know, I know fishing. I know I'll go back to that. When Jesus wanted to make him a fisher of men. But Jesus surprisingly for Peter, he surprised Peter. He went and he found Peter fishing. Remember he was in the boat? He found him fishing. Peter had to cover himself up because he was almost naked. He was in his underclothes. Jesus found him fishing. He reminded him of his calling. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said, lambs, tend my sheep. And he reinstated him. And Peter went on to head the early church of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, Peter wasn't much of a fisherman, of a man. Uh, uh, he, was, he wasn't much of a, a speaker or whatever, but the Holy Spirit took over because he was available. You see, Peter was repentant. And when he went to the Lord, when the Lord found him, he said, my Lord, he recognized the Lord and God forgave him. You too may have been a counterfeit Christian until now, but you do not need to remain that way. Jesus can take a fake and make it genuine. Jesus can take a fake and make it genuine. Call to Jesus right now, tonight. Ask him to forgive you and reinstate you. And from then on, walk in step with the Holy Spirit, allowing him to guide you every day, allowing him to guide your every thought and your every action. I trust you've enjoyed God's word and that it has been a blessing to you. If you're inspired by it, please share it with your friends and family. Remember, we're live on Facebook every Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. This is Pastor Simon, and as always, it has been my pleasure. Till next time, God bless.